Hello guys, this is Krista Lewis from Dusty FC in Space, and this is Ryan from Seeking Stories. Ryan and his wife just started over on their channel a breakdown of Harry Potter chapter by chapter, comparing it with the movie, and it's super cool. And of course, he's one of my Storm Along 2020 co-hosts. So we're good friends and we're hoping we can chat with you guys down in the comments what you think about this video. And I hope you will go check out his channel after you're done watching this. Today, we're going to be talking about Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. And we're going to break it down into a character web for you. We're going to be using the John Truby version of the character web because both Ryan and I really enjoy the writings of John Truby. He wrote the book The Anatomy of Story and mm -hmm. we're going to be using that for our breakdown here. Really good book. Yes, very good book. John Truby's character web is all about comparing characters to one another because he says that's what makes them unique and meaningful mm -hmm. to the audience. Before we actually get into the character web, I think we should start with the premise. Do you have any thoughts on what the premise might be? Well, Hunchback's interesting because it does take so many like perspectives, but I think you can almost look at like Esmeralda as like the, the key focus of the story. And then it's just my take on the premise, but it would be almost like four individuals who are wrestling through kind of what things like love and lust and infatuation mean through this one gypsy girl, Esmeralda, and the different character journeys it takes them on. Notre Dame is like the, the backdrop of it all, which I'm sure we'll get into in the in the video. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because that's like exactly what I had for my premise. Not necessarily like that the whole thing is focused on Esmeralda, but four suitors vie for the attention of the gypsy Esmeralda. Well, that's one thing I feel like a lot of storytellers, writers, you they have to figure out right from the beginning, uh, especially when they're pitching a story to a publisher or a film production company it's how can you encapsulate the story into a lot of times they say 25 words or less it's a way of instantly telling someone really quickly what the story is about exactly and to do the character web at all it really helps to have an idea of what the focus of the story is which is essentially the premise the premise is the entire story distilled into one line and it suggests the essence of the story okay so let's get into the hero yes so the he is the person who has the central problem and who drives the action in the attempt to solve the problem. He decides to go after a goal or desire, but he possesses certain weaknesses and needs that hold him back from success. There's some examples in the book from Hamlet. The example is Hamlet who wants to avenge his father's murder. And then from a streetcar named Desire, the hero is Blanche Dubois who wants to marry Mitch Kowalski. So from Hunchback, do you think there is a hero? And if so, who do you think it is? I've been struggling with this since like halfway through the book um, because the the movie and the musical very clearly focus on Quasimodo. They take him and they say he's the hero. They expand his scenes. They really delve into him from like a, um, a thematic perspective, from a character change perspective. But in the book, it's like he shows up a little bit at the beginning and then he's gone for chapters and chapters and chapters. And like he has uh, so much to do with the end of the story and the theme is wrapped up in him. But at the same time, I struggle to say, is he really the hero? Is he the driving force in the story enough to call him to be able to call him the hero? And then I got to thinking like, well, if he's not the hero, who are some other options? And I ruled out Esmeralda because everything kind of revolves around her, but she doesn't seem to be like the one driving the action. And then you've got like Phoebus and Pierre, who also, I think we talked about at the beginning, four people um, you know, vying for Esmeralda, but they almost seem like, you know, on different ends of the stages. So then I kind of came to, could it be Frollo in a way? Could he be like the dark protagonist? Because he's the one who kind of like incites all, all the action. He's the one who inter interacts with every single character. Um, he's the one whose desire, even though it's an evil desire, changes everyone's lives by the end of the story. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to like commit to like it being Claude Frollo, but in a way, like, I feel like he's an option. That makes sense to me, honestly. I pretty much laid out two options throughout my character web because I was not sure if Quasimodo or Claude Frollo was the hero, whereas Claude Frollo actually would be an anti-hero, but I, I totally agree with you. He drives the action here. Without him, I don't think the story would have happened. Everyone just kind of lived on their, their merry lives or horrible lives and nothing would have changed for better or for worse. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, in, in a lot of stories, that is the case with the opponent. If they hadn't started attacking the hero, the story wouldn't have happened. But at some point, fairly soon in the story, you see that the hero develops some kind of desire line. Right. And, but it's tough to look at Quasimodo and say, yeah, he has a desire line. First desire line that we really 
see from him other than wanting to please Claude Frollo is mm -hmm. saving Esmeralda, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. So that's like a long time to wait for a desire line to start. It's a really long time. I think the only other slight argument you might be able to make is during like the Feast of Fools where he's crowned king and he kind of sees everyone adoring him. And he, one could make the argument that he's, you know, he desires that, but I don't think that's a strong enough moment. I agree with you that the moment where um, Esmeralda, you know, is, is kind to him, one of the first people to show him kindness is, I guess, for him, his inciting incident, seeing that the, there is someone else out there in the world that cares for him. That's a really good point. Because after that, he starts watching. Everybody is watching her, but he's Yeah, watching. it's it's really a creeper of a story. <laughs> you know, they're all stalkers. <laughs> they all are, all four of them. I was tempted to say that, like you said, Quasimodo, he has the theme all wrapped up in him. He's the titular character, the hunchback mm -hmm. of Notre Dame. He's the only character with positive character growth. It seems like he, like you said, he's ex inextricably tied up with the cathedral, which is the main inspiration for the whole novel. Victor Hugo wanted right. to save the cathedral and other medieval architecture like it. So yeah, it seems like he's like set up to be the main character and then Claude Frollo does all the action <laughs> until a certain right. story. Mm -hmm. It's because of him that Quasimodo even interacts with Esmeralda at all because he's the one who tries to get Quasimodo to kidnap her. Right. And, then, and throughout the book, he does have a development arc like Quasimodo, except his is a deterioration arc. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Quasimodo is tragic too, but it's also positive because like his soul opens up into love for the first time. Right, whereas Frollo deteriorates. Yes, into madness and obsession. And his lust for knowledge <laughs> and power over Esmeralda seems to be what drove him there. Mm -hmm. So what about main opponent? So the main opponent is the person who most wants to keep the hero from achieving his goal. He wants the same thing as the hero, which is why they keep butting heads. He may not be someone, however, that the hero hates. Like in a romance, the people who are falling in love or not falling in love are hero and main opponent. So they may not hate each other. So in Hamlet, King Claudius is the main opponent. And in Streetcar Named Desire, Stanley Kowalski is the main opponent. So in Hunchback, Ryan, who do you think is the main opponent? That's another good question. Another one that I struggled with going through the notes ahead of time. And I think that in Frollo's mind, he would see Phoebus as his main opponent. Mm -hmm. Just because Esmeralda, for some reason, which I'd never understood, is completely infatuated with Phoebus, um, the soldier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But really, like, Phoebus does so little like against you know Frollo, so to speak, that he couldn't really be considered from a story perspective, I think the true antagonist, even though Frollo would, if he was here with us today, would argue something very different. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would have to be by the end of the story, uh, Quasimodo, because Quasimodo is the one who kind of says basically, I think, in, I don't, I'm not sure if he says it in the, uh, in the book, but I know in the musical and movies, like no master. And that's, it was a huge thing because um, he never said no to his master. So he becomes the antagonistic force that's really protecting uh, Esmeralda from Frollo and becomes kind of the central focus there. Okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. What did you have? So for the anti-hero <laughs> version of my character web, I thought Esmeralda would be the main opponent for Frollo because she oh, yeah. would be with Phoebus and she would rather die than be with Frollo. So it's kind of like a lover's arc there where he wants her, she does not want him. So they're main opponents. And for if the hero was Quasimodo, then I thought the main opponent was Frollo because mm -hmm. he would rather destroy Esmeralda if she won't be with him, Frollo, that is. Um, and But these char those two characters aren't really battling until the scene where Quasimodo saves Esmeralda from ex execution initially. Right. So it's kind of like saying that they are opponents if they're not even battling for most of the book. <laughs> right, right. And that's a great I, a perspective on Esmeralda being the main antagonist um, or the main opponent for Frollo. I didn't even think about that, but that, that makes sense that she is, even though he or she is like his focus, she's also the one, you know, rightly so, repulsing him and repelling him. What about the secondary, tertiary, tertiary and quaternary? I don't know how you pronounce that. 
opponents. Maybe I'll just say the second, third, and fourth opponents. There we go. So these characters are just other people in the story who want to stop the hero from getting his desire. So in Hamlet, that would be Queen Gertrude and Polonius and Claudius, who is Claudius's advisor. And then in Streetcar Named Desire, it doesn't actually have anybody for those opponents. There's just Stanley Kowalski. <laughs> in Hunchback, Ryan, who do you think could be those other side opponents? Uh, well, if we go with, again, Frollo is the, the anti-hero. Um, I agree, Esmeralda is, you know, like you said, Christy, probably the main antagonist. Um, I think I would then go to kind of my original answer is uh, Quasimodo is the second antagonist, and then Phoebus, because those are really the three that kind of present obstacles in Frollo's path. We have some other characters like um, Pierre, the writer, who he's a little bit frustrating to Frollo, but in the end, Frollo really uses him to for his own advantage. So I don't really think he could really be a true antagonistic character. So I think I would go with with those three. For the antihero one, I think the only one that I really even identified was Phoebus. So if we're looking at how they all want Esmeralda, he only wants Esmeralda for a very brief fling, you know, period right. of the time. The only way he's an antagonist after that point is that he's a distraction for Esmeralda. From right. <clears throat> he's like the better deal that she is all constantly striving for. He was the only one that I even thought of. So you actually even thought of more than I did. <laughs> but I did compare for if Quasimodo was the hero, alternate character web. King Louis could be Quasimodo's opponent because he yeah. can't stand any challenge to his power. So when the people want to destroy the sorceress, he decides he has to destroy the sorceress. That actually like seems to help. <laughs> Frollo, because at that point, Frollo wants Esmeralda dead at the end, so the king's men destroy her. So mm -hmm. he helps Frollo and definitely goes against Quasimodo. And then, yeah. as you said, Gringoire could be also Quasimodo's opponent, because even though he initially vies for Esmeralda's attentions, he only ends up caring for Jolly, the animal double of Esmeralda, and he ends up helping Frollo deliver Esmeralda to the authorities saving Jolly at Esmeralda's expense. So if Quasimodo is the hero, then Gringoire could be seen as an opponent. Yeah. I almost feel like everyone is opponent against Quasimodo in a way, which is so sad. Yes, he has no friends. His friends are a mad archdeacon, and that's yeah. it. That's it. Even Esmeralda isn't really his friend. She doesn't even care yeah. about him. Kind of like a typical 16-year-old teenage girl. She falls for the image that... Exactly. Off. It's a false yeah. image, but she falls for in, it. In the movie, I think they make her a, a little bit older. I'm not sure how much, but probably at least 20s, maybe. Someone who has yeah, been through life a little bit more. Let's move on to allies. Yes, and the fun one. I didn't have very many answers. Allies serve as a sounding board for the hero, allowing the audience to hear the values and feelings of the hero. Usually, the ally's goal is the same as the hero's, but occasionally, the ally has a goal of his own. So in Hamlet, Horatio is the ally. In A Streetcar Named to Desire, there is again no ally. And in Hunchback, Ryan, let's hear your thoughts. <laughs> so I think for Frollo, his allies, I mean, I think for a lot of it, he considers like the people he works closely with, like Quasimodo and um, Pierre, even, and I can't remember their names now, but they're um, people that he's trying trying to do like that, turning the gold into magic, which or gold into, uh, or sun into gold, however that magic thing was working, which I thought was a really weird subplot that didn't really have a lot to do with the story, other than yeah. just to show that Frollo is going completely insane. Um, mm -hmm. But he has a lot of people that he that he kind of like forces to do his will, um, or connives or convinces otherwise. And I think he would see a lot of them as his allies, even though you know they may be doing so unwittingly. I think this is a little bit of a stretch argument, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, even though he considers uh, Phoebus an opponent, I think at one point he considers him an ally because he dresses uh, Frollo dresses up as like a ghost figure to like help get Phoebus in like a compromising position so that he can this then Frollo can like go and like do his dastardly work. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying there. <laughs> so. Initially, Quasimodo was Frollo's ally in trying to get Esmeralda to kidnap her. And he would have been his ally in pretty much anything until the end mm -hmm. that Frollo was being so evil. <laughs> Gringoire is Frollo's ally at the end, getting Esmeralda. And mm -hmm. then Paquette, the blue sister, also helps Frollo. So they're all just like almost not real allies. They're like incidental allies. Right. Or... And most of them wouldn't consider Except themselves allies. 
Right, exactly. Only Quasimodo would have been like, yes, I'm your ally! For Quasimodo, <clears throat> I didn't think he had any help from anybody. He didn't really talk out loud to anybody because he literally couldn't. Except <clears throat> maybe the gargoyles could be his his allies. Yeah. <laughs> they feel more like he wasn't alone. Yeah, may maybe, maybe the bells too, because he like, names them. Yes, that's true. He names the bells. Yes, the bells and the gargoyles. Yeah. Now, let's move on to the fake ally opponents. The fake ally opponent <laughs> is a character who appears to be the hero's friend, but is actually an opponent. He often feels torn by a dilemma. While pretending to be an ally, he actually comes to feel like an ally and helps the hero win, even as he's working to defeat the hero. So for Hamlet, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern are the fake ally opponents. And for a streetcar named Desire, Mitch, who is Stanley's brother, Stanley's friend, and Stella Kowalski, Blanche's sister, are the fake ally opponents. And then in Hunchback, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. For the fake ally opponent, I had, again, because I'm only fo mainly focused on Frollo, I had mm -hmm. Quasimodo as the fake ally opponent because um, Frollo uses Ooh. Quasimodo so many times, but in the end, I mean, Quasimodo is definitely Frollo's demise. Um, mm -hmm. That's the only one I could really come up with for Quasimodo. I actually had a, in a, in a weird way, I'd look more at Esmeralda for this one because she also interacted with so many people, probably more so than almost anyone other than Frollo. And I feel like um, Pierre, the author, who like rescued her at the end, but in the end, he does turn out to be one of the main reasons why she perishes. Those are those are just good thoughts. So let's move on to subplot character, which this one is interesting. I, I love thinking about the subplot character. So the subplot character function is often misunderstood as a kind of secondary protagonist, but in reality, it is used as a way of contrasting. How the main character and a second character deal with the same problem in slightly different ways. Through comparison, the subplot character highlights the traits and dilemmas of the main character. So in Hamlet, Laertes, who is also trying to avenge his father's murder, is the subplot character. Did you think there was in The Hunchback of Notre Dame? Um, I kind of did. So I looked back at kind of our, our premise at the beginning where it was Esmeralda and then kind of four characters that are kind of like weaving around her, almost like she's the spoke like the, the hub of a wheel and they're like spokes of it. Uh -huh. And again, looking to Frollo is the, the anti-hero. I think you can make a case for um, Pierre, Quasimodo, and Phoebus in a way to be kind of subplot characters. Because again, okay. they're all dealing with, with Esmeralda and they're dealing with different forms of love, lust, infatuation. Pierre is more like a fear and a carelessness. Um, Phoebus also has that carelessness to him. But they're all dealing with, in a way, like how to best, and I use this term very loosely, but love in their own ways. And they have very definition, very different definitions of that. But in, in a way, I think you could slice them all differently and say, well, they're all kind of, in a way, looking for a similar version of the same thing, even though it manifests in very different ways, very different outcomes. Yeah, I was kind of thinking kind of something similar, and I wasn't sure if opponents could be subplot characters. So I was like... <laughs> Can they? I don't even Maybe. know. Maybe. Because allies usually aren't. And so I was like, oh, is there any more prohibitions that I don't, that I'm not aware yeah. of? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Truby is like really big on like taking different parts of like stories or genres and like merging them together in as many ways as you can. So mm -hmm. I feel like, I feel like Truby would like give that a stamp of approval, but I don't, I okay. don't know. Okay. We'll go with it then. That makes <laughs> sense. It, that does make sense because if, if the central problem is, how to get this beautiful gypsy to fall in love with me. And then there's four guys competing for that in different ways. It mm -hmm. makes sense that they all go about it very different ways. So yeah, yeah. It makes sense. <laughs> okay, and that is it, guys. Thank you so much for watching with us. If you have any comments, please leave them down below in the comments. We'd love to hear them. And again, please do check out Ryan's channel. He's a great booktuber and you will love his wife. Just, just head on over there, I promise. You will not be sorry. Um, well, thanks for hosting me, Christy. It's been a great conversation. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, this was so much fun. This was awesome. <laughs> Take care, guys.